One of the most bizarre sentencing from 77 years ago produced the youngest death row inmate in America's history. A case that has in many ways defined the American legal system, the execution of George Stinney. Was his death a mere abuse of power? What led to this terrible miscarriage of justice? Stick with me as we delve into the fate of George Stinney. The year was 1944 in the city of Alcolu, South Carolina, in a segregated community where the whites and blacks lived, separated by a railroad. It was in this town that a young, 14-year-old George Stinney had a brief conversation that would change both his life and his family's forever. George came from a humble background, with a father, George Stinney Sr., who worked in a sawmill as a sharecropper, and a mother, Amy Stinney, who was a cook at Alcolu's all-black school. He was the second among five siblings, and thanks to his father's work, they all lived in a three-roomed home that was provided for them by their father's company. It wasn't much, but it was honest living for the Stinney family. All of that, however, quickly turned around with the disappearance of Betty June and Mary Emma Thames, two young, white sisters that lived in the same town, who unfortunately for George, weren't complete strangers. One day, in March 1944, George and his sister were on their way home after grazing their family cow. He met Betty June, aged 11, and Mary Emma, aged 7, for the first time. The two girls were on an adventure in search of a fruit called a maypop, stopping only to ask George and his sister where they could find the fruit and heading off on their way. When the two girls didn't make it back by sundown, the police were alerted. The search party was immediately organized. Hundreds of people, including George's father, spent all night searching. George, in a bid to help, informed the authorities that he had seen them on his way home, telling them they said they would be going to the railroad. The police kept this information in mind. At sunrise, their bodies were found in a muddy ditch. Seven-year-old Emma had a hole boring through her skull, while 11-year-old Betty June had suffered blows to the head. The autopsy reported that she had received seven blows from a round instrument, leaving the back of her head as nothing but a mass of crushed bones. This left the town stumped. Who on earth would want to hurt two little girls? Ever since the discovery, two theories about the unfortunate fate of the girls cropped up. One version, which heavily implicated young George, was that he followed them after their meeting, assaulting them to death with a railroad spike while attempting to rape Betty June. The second version, which was whispered as unfounded rumors, says that the girls stopped by the house of a prominent man in the community to see if his good-natured wife would like to accompany them on their travels. Though she wasn't able to go, her son offered to carry them in his lumber mill truck, an offer they apparently took and were whisked away, never to be heard from again. But the police weren't very interested in looking for a white killer, not when they had a perfectly good black child to scapegoat. So. The police did what they were trained to do, and picked up 14-year-old George and his older brother Johnny, arresting them as the culprits responsible for the gruesome murder. The odds were stacked pretty heavily against poor George. Not only was he surrounded by white policemen who seemed to believe he was a murderer, his family wasn't even allowed into the interrogation room or the courtroom. George's questioning was relentless, with officers screaming at him to admit his guilt, asking if he had tried to rape Betty and failed hours upon hours of mentally assaulting the poor child. All he could do was endure it, all by himself, all without a lawyer or his family by his side, all alone. A trial was held to determine the fate of George Stinney. The charges were brought and a court session was held. His publicly provided attorney, Charles Plowden, didn't seem very interested in proving the innocence of his client. He called no witnesses to the stand. He cross-examined nobody. He didn't even bother looking at the evidence. The evidence brought to prove his guilt was completely circumstantial and lacked proper legal procedure. All they had against George was that he talked to the girls on the same day they died. And the presiding officer of the case, Officer H.S. Newman, along with the members of the interrogation team, said he confessed. On April 24, 1944, after 10 minutes of deliberation, the all-white jury found him guilty and convicted him to death by electrocution. One of the most shocking things in the George Tinney case is he was tried by a jury of 12 white men. Um, that certainly is not a jury of his peers. That's certainly not a cross-section of Clarendon County at the time, which was half African-American, half white. And here we have an all-white jury with his family not being even allowed into the courtroom. But George's suffering wasn't over yet. 
When the news spread that two white girls were killed by a black boy, this led to an uproar in the white community. A clamor arose to lynch both the boy and his entire family. In response to this, George was held in a secret location, so even during the last days of his life, his family couldn't visit him. They didn't even know where he was. As George's execution day approached after that sham of a trial, things on the outside were changing for the worse. Wanting to have no relations with a convicted murderer, companies did what they're good at and cut their losses. They fired George Stinney Sr., taking away his family's home and their livelihood, tossing them out into a world where people wanted to murder them on the street. Young George's execution was not without protest, though. Ministerial unions of all races petitioned on his behalf. Their arguments ranged from the ethics of killing a child to the Christian morality and justice of the trial and conviction. There were letters and telegrams sent to the governor's office, petitioning for clemency, but all those were to no avail. Protests were mounted, warning the governor Olin Johnson of rising racial tensions, but it was too late. Too many bloodthirsty people wanted their pound of flesh. It's speculated that George's father and mother were allowed to see him one more time before his execution. Whether that's bitter or sweet, you decide. But what is certain is that his minister was allowed to see him and grant him his last rites as a death row inmate. On June 16, 1944, George was marched to the electric chair. Weighing in at around 95 pounds and 5 feet 1 inch tall, he was dressed in a striped jumpsuit and led to the chair accompanied by the minister and his trusted Bible cradled to his chest. Being a child about to be strapped in a chair designed for adults, he was so small that the officials had difficulty setting the electrodes around his limbs. They took the Bible from George and used it as a booster for his seat. His father was allowed to approach the chair and say his farewells. Then an officer asked George if he had any final words. He simply shook his head, no. They pulled a strap and put it over his mouth. Then they strapped his hands and legs. George began to cry futile tears as the executioners prepared him for his death. They placed an ill-fitted adult mask over his tear-stained face. The signal was given and 2400 volts were sent through his body. His body jerked violently. The mask on his face slipped off and his wide-eyed, teary, saliva-covered face was clear for all to witness. After two more jolts of electricity, it was over. They had successfully killed a child. In the short span of three months, a 14-year-old boy had been arrested, accused of murder, tried, convicted, and executed by the state of South Carolina. George Stinney's murder conviction was re-evaluated in 2014, 70 years after his execution. His siblings always believed that he was innocent. After all, he did have a foolproof alibi. George had spent the entire day the girls disappeared with his sister Amy. And I want to clear the air. We are not allowed to go any place without my mother's permission. They were very strict with us. We could not go no place, nowhere. But the police weren't interested in an alibi. The entire case was an obvious racist sham, so a few people went ahead to clear his name. And that they did, obviously. With the assistance of Georgie Frierson, Steve McKenzie, Matt Burgess, and Ray Brown, a motion for a new trial was filed on October 25th, 2013. It was brought to light that a culprit had already been named for the case after a deathbed confession. This culprit was rumored to be a white male from a prominent family who was by 2013 already deceased. Not only that, but to add insult to injury, the culprit was also part of the jury for George's sham trial. Actual proper evidence was given in the court hearing in January 2014. Testimonies came from both his siblings and a non-relative witness. George's former cellmate, Wilford Hunter, had stated that George never wrote a confession, but was told by George that he had been made to confess, even though he was innocent. George's confession was rendered null and void because of course it was. After all, this so-called evidence was an unrecorded, unsigned confession by a 14-year-old boy who was deprived of legal counsel and parental guidance. Judge Cullen Mullen, in December 2014, vacated George's conviction on the grounds that he did not receive a fair trial and his Sixth Amendment right was violated. She ruled that in line with the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment, the execution of a 14-year-old boy in less than 90 days constituted cruel and unusual punishment. George's siblings were understandably overjoyed to be able to live and witness their brother's name being exonerated after 70 years, 
but this still comes as cold comfort for the grave injustice they suffered. As George's brother Charles puts it, He already paid for his life and nothing will, even if they uh, take it off, it will still not bring him back. And that was the fate of George Stinney. He lived a short life, was accused of a crime he never committed, and died surrounded by strangers, only for his name to finally be exonerated after 70 years. A true American tragedy. If you want to see something less tragic, click on the video on the screen and check out how serial killer Ted Bundy was actually caught. See you there.